In today's lecture, we're going to explore one of the most powerful results in all of calculus. And that result is called the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. So, the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus is as follows. So suppose we have a function f of x. So let f of x be a function. And then suppose that we have an antiderivative. Suppose that capital F of x is an antiderivative for little f of x. In other words, the derivative of capital F of x is the function little f of x. So in this circumstance, we can say the following. The integral from a to b of f of x dx is equal to capital F of b minus capital F of a. And this result is known as the fundamental theorem of calculus, which says that whenever you have an antiderivative for a function and you want to compute the value of its definite integral from a to b, all you have to do is take the antiderivative, evaluate it at b, and then subtract off the value of the antiderivative at a. So the integral of a function from a to b is equal to the net change in its antiderivative between the points a and b. So we previously saw what goes into this left-hand side, into the definition of the definite integral. We have to break up the interval from a to b into a number of subintervals. And then we approximate the output of the function once per subinterval. We multiply those values by delta x and we sum them all together. And then the definite integral represents a limit of that as n goes to infinity. So as the number of subintervals goes to infinity. So we have to do that process over and over again until the outputs of our Riemann sum level out at some number, which we call the definite integral of f of x. It's a lot of work. We saw some examples for simple functions. f of x is equal to x, and f of x is equal to x squared. And it was a bit of work to actually work out the definite integral using the Riemann sums and using summation formulas and then computing the limit. This says that as long as you have an antiderivative, boom, you get the answer almost instantly. You can do it in your head many times. It's just the antiderivative evaluated at b minus the antiderivative evaluated at a. So let's see the proof of this. Let's see why it's true. So proof, well, we start off with unraveling the definition. So the integral from a to b of f of x dx, we said that that was the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum i equals 1 to n f of x i star times delta x. So it's the limit as n goes to infinity of your Riemann sum with n subintervals. So that is the definition of the definite integral. So that's our definition. And then a number of things go into the right-hand side. So basically, delta x is going to be b minus a over n. And then x sub i is going to be a plus i delta x. So these are our friends from uh, Riemann sums. So and then x sub i star will be any point between x sub i minus 1 and x sub i. So depending on which point you choose, you might get one type of Riemann sum or another type. You might get a left-hand Riemann sum if you always choose the left end point. You might get a right-hand Riemann sum if you always choose the right end point. Or you can construct a random Riemann sum. For each interval, just pick a point at random. Or point the po pick the point in the middle or the point two-thirds to the right or two-thirds one way or the other. Um, so there's, so we mentioned before that it really doesn't matter which point you pick because in the limit as n goes to infinity, the left and right endpoints are getting closer and closer to each other. So the difference in the output becomes minuscule over such a small change in delta x. Um, that's not a rigorous argument. You know, the, it's actually proved uh, in a, a later course called analysis. But it, it's intuitive enough, intuitive enough that we can just accept that as a given for now. Now, the question 
when you're looking at this, there's a subtle point. And the question is, do you actually absolutely need to know what values of X you're choosing when you're approximating the height of these rectangles? So remember the F of X sub I star, this is a height and then the delta X is a width. You multiply the height of the rectangle by its width and you get its area. So we're adding up the area of a bunch of rectangles. So do you actually need to know the value of x sub i star? Do you need to know the point at which you're approximating the height? The answer is no. All you need to know is what the height of the rectangle is or your approximation. All you need to know is that the rectangle has a certain height on that subinterval or the function has a certain height on that subinterval and you can use that height to approximate the area by approximating that subinterval as simply a rectangle. So, I mean, it seems like a weird question. How would you figure out f of x if you didn't know what x was? Well, actually, there's a way, and it's a very, very special type of Riemann sum, and that's the way to get to the proof of the fundamental theorem of calculus. And it has to do with the mean value theorem. So this is a little review from Calc 1. So it's the mean value theorem. Oh. So the mean value theorem says that if you have a differentiable function f, so if f is differentiable on the interval from a to b, which means that it's going to be continuous on a to b, then there exists a point, which we'll call C, somewhere contained in the interval from A to B, such that F prime of C is equal to F of B minus F of A over B minus A. Now, just a, a quick refresher on the mean value theorem. What is this theorem saying? Well, it says that if you have a function, this between two points, and it's differentiable, so there are no kinks in it, there's no corners or anything like that, it will always be a nice smooth curve. The right-hand side here is the average rate of change of the function between A and B. And the average rate of change of the function between A and B is the slope of the line connecting those two endpoints. So if I connect the two endpoints with a straight line, the slope of this line is just equal to f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Now what this is saying is that there is some point c between a and b, you know, it could be, for example, the point maybe right here, such that the derivative at the point c, and remember the derivative is the slope of the tangent line, is equal to the slope of this line. So in other words, at some point on the interval, the instantaneous rate of change has to equal the average rate of change. That makes sense. If you're driving along a highway and your average speed is 78 miles per hour, well, you can't be above 70 miles per hour for the whole trip. You, have to, you can be above 70 miles per hour and then below 70 miles per hour, but to get to the two regime, uh, regimes, you have to pass through 70 miles per hour. So there has to be at least one moment in time where your speed was 70 miles per hour. So that's the uh, heart of the mean value theorem or the statement of the mean value theorem. So what, so what does this say? So this applies to our Riemann sum for the following reasons. Suppose we have an antiderivative for the function little f. So we're basically going to use the mean value theorem on the antiderivative. So if we use the, so if we basically repackage the mean value theorem and apply it to the antiderivative of f on the ith subinterval, what do we get? So that means, okay, well, capital F is going to be differentiable, right? So remember, capital F prime of x is just equal to little f of x, okay? Our ith subinterval, ith subinterval, was the interval x sub i minus 1 to x sub i, and the width is just delta x. 
So when it says is there is some point, so there exists there exists a point, which I'm going to call x sub i star, I think you'll see where I'm going with this, on the ith subinterval, such that the derivative of capital F, the derivative of capital F, and the derivative of capital F is little f. So I'm just going to write little f of x sub i star is going to equal capital F of x sub i minus capital F of x sub i minus 1 over x sub i minus x sub i minus 1, which is just delta x. So this is exactly the mean value theorem, the same as this guy right up here, because capital F prime is little f. So here I have a little f on the left and capital F on the right. So the instantaneous rate of change of capital F, so in other words, the value of little f at some point has to equal the average rate of change of the antiderivative over that subinterval. Right? That's exactly the statement of the mean value theorem. So we don't know where the point is, but we know by the mean value theorem that there has to be a point on the ith subinterval where little f evaluated at that point is equal to the total change in capital F over that subinterval divided by delta x. So the trick here for this for our Riemann sum, we're going to do a very, very special Riemann sum today where we use this point that we don't know where it is. But we know the output of little f, so we know the height of the rectangle. So we're going to use this formula for the height of the rectangle in our formula for the Riemann sum. And let's watch what happens. So let me get rid of this stuff. So x sub i sub star is on the ith subinterval. OK. All right, so our Riemann sum with n subintervals, and this is our special Riemann sum, is going to equal the sum i equals 1 to n. Now f of x sub i star is going to be given by the mean value theorem. And this only works if we have an antiderivative. So we assume that we have an antiderivative. So f of x sub i star is capital F of x sub i minus capital F of x sub i minus 1, all divided by delta x, and then times delta x. So we're summing all that together. Now, the astute observer will notice that there's a delta x in the denominator and in the numerator, which cancel each other. So each term has a factor of delta x over delta x. So this is just the sum of capital F of xi minus capital F of xi minus 1. Now this is a very, very special type of sum. It's something called a telescoping series. And telescoping series are neat. And the reason why is because let's write out the terms and see what happens. So I'm going to start, I'm going to write out the terms of this series in reverse order. So I'm going to start with i is equal to n. So I'm going to take i is equal to n and plug i is equal to n into this series for the nth term. So the nth term will be capital F of xn minus capital F of xn minus 1. Just substituted n or for i. The next to the last term will be n minus 1. So when we get plus f of x n minus 1 minus capital F of x n minus 2, because n minus 2 is n minus 1 minus 1. And then for the n minus 2 term, I get plus capital F of x n minus 2 minus capital F of x n minus 3. And then it continues that like that for a while. Then eventually we get to you know, plus f of x 3. So this is for the third term minus f of x2, and then we get plus f of x2 minus capital F of x1, and then plus capital F of x1 minus capital F of x0. Now something is happening here. Plus capital F of x1 in the first term cancels out with minus capital F of x1 in the second term. Plus capital F of x2 in the second term cancels with plus minus capital F of x2 in the third term plus capital F of x3 in the third term cancels with 
a minus capital F of X3, which we know is in the fourth term, and so on. All these are canceling. This gets knocked out from something below. And the N minus two term, capital F of XN minus two, cancels out with minus capital F of XN minus two in the N minus one term. And the N minus one term, capital F of XN minus one, cancels out with minus capital F of XN minus one in the nth term. And so all these guys cancel like that. Only two terms are left standing, capital F of Xn and minus capital F of X0. So if you use the mean value theorem on your Riemann sum to find F of X sub I sub star, your Riemann sum will give you capital F of Xn minus capital F of X0. Now we previously saw when we studied Riemann sums that X sub 0 is always equal to A for any Riemann sum, and X sub N is always equal to B for any Riemann sum. So this is just equal to capital F of B minus capital F of A. So this is indeed a very special type of Riemann sum because for this special type of Riemann sum, the value you get does not depend on N. And only for this type of Riemann sum, the Riemann sum with N subintervals, when you do it this way, it doesn't matter what n is. You just get the, the answer derivative at b minus the answer derivative, at a, answer derivative at a. It's the same thing every time. So now we have a special type of Riemann sum that gives you the same output. So the output up here is a constant. So when we take the limit as n goes to infinity, we still get capital F of b minus capital F of a. Because for if you do n is equal to 1,000, if you do 10,000, 100,000, you still get capital F of B minus capital F of A. It always telescopes like this, and you always just get the antiderivative at the last term minus the antiderivative at the first term. So therefore, this one is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of this, which is constant. It doesn't depend on n. So therefore, this has to equal that. And that's the fundamental theorem of calculus. So our final... box, we get this famous result, integral from a to b of little f of x dx is equal to capital F of b minus capital F of a. And perhaps you might also notice why this is called the definite integral. So when you first look at this definition where you take the limit of the Riemann sums, it looks nothing like the integral of f of x dx, which was equal to capital F of x plus c. So the indefinite integral just tells you the family of antiderivatives for your function. Right. And then the definite integral is defined this way, and it kind of looks very different than anything about antiderivatives. Well, now you see how they're related. The definite integral is definite because you're taking the antiderivative and looking at the difference of the antiderivative between two points. So it's definite in that you fixed your two endpoints and you're looking at the difference in the antiderivative between those two points. The indefinite integral, so without limits of integration, if you just say the integral of f of x, just gives you the antiderivative. And it's still a function of x. So the indefinite integral, notice on the left, is still a function of x on the right. The definite integral, you fix the endpoints and now you're evaluating the antiderivative between the lower and the upper endpoint. So this is no longer a function of x. This just tells you the area between two points on your curve. So that's why it's definite versus indefinite. Um, so it's a little aside on the nomenclature, but the, the result, which is, is a wonderful, exquisite proof here, uh, powerful stuff, integral from a to b, f of x, dx, capital F of b, minus capital F of A.